All right, so I'm going to share my screen here. Um, can you see it? Yes. All right, great. So first off, I have a cold, so excuse me if I'm a little bit low energy here as I talk about this. Um, so I'm the I'm the technical support for Spotlight here, and uh, Sari and Andrea are like the primary collections managers of the site. They're the ones that actually decide what goes up and all that stuff, make the uh, exhibits. So I'm gonna go over a few modifications we've made to Spotlight, and then maybe they'll talk about what we've done with those modifications. Your audio has gone away or else you're not speaking. Sorry about that. I don't remember clicking mute. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm going crazy though. Uh, yes, can you hear me now? Yep. All right. This is the front page. We have about eight exhibits now with a bunch more in progress. We'll get more and more as time goes on. We've been using it for a year and a half, about, I think about a year and a half. We are a bit behind in our spotlight version because we are a bit behind in our uh, kind of stack behind it, the Fedora and all that stuff. And we're in the middle of this really large migration from Fedora three to four and from like a bunch of kind of custom Hydra installations to the new uh, Hyrax 2.1. So because we're behind in all of that, spotlight's kind of gotten slowed down a bit in recent times, but we're hoping we'll be done with that soon. Uh, the most important the, the thing we've done, I think the most prominent thing we've done so far is hooked, it, hooked Spotlight up to Fedora 3. And so that the people here can access stuff directly from our digital library. So here we have from the external resource, we have Fedora IDs. And so if you went to say our digital library and thought you want, hey, this is a nice picture of Jumbo. You can grab the ID, put it in here. We can do a couple. We're doing a jumbo exhibit here. And then import. It might take a second. And then we have them in here. And they are, the data is pulled straight from, uh, from Fedora. And you see you can't edit it here, but if we were to edit it in the digital library, it would update here automatically. So that's probably the most uh, important thing we've done. And of course, this will, once we upgrade, this will kind of go away, because we'll just use triple IF after we upgrade to Fedora 4. But um, that's most of what we've done. We've done a few other customizations Oh, actually, real quick, I want to show just a little bit of that. And I know this isn't a tech call, so I won't go too in depth. But did you say it automatically updates in a Spotlight if something changes in Fedora? Yes. Some metadata. Well, because Spotlight automatically indexes periodically, so every time it indexes, it pulls the new data from Fedora if it's there. So yes. So it's a pull, not a push. It is a pull. Yes. You can go in and trigger that pull if you know you've changed the metadata in your digital library and you want it to reflect, you can go in and click the re-index button as well in the exhibit and it will yeah, so you, do that sooner rather than later. You can manually do it. You just click this and it will do it for you. And you keep doing it all the time anyway. But this is all based on, so this is all, we have this big YAML file that I don't know who, if anyone here is familiar with like the internals of Fedora 3, but there's data streams with metadata in them and it's just a big YAML file with all of the information we're gonna to wanna to pull. And the catalog controller and the importer both read this file so that they're both looking for the same things. Yeah. So that's the main thing. We've also added this, uh, so Sari decided she didn't always want every single feature page she ever made to be in the menu. So we've also added this in-menu functionality where we have this page called not in menu. And you'll notice if you go to this exhibit, 
one with that. Because that's the main page. Yeah. <laughs> Notice that not in menu is not in the menu because we've added this little button here in menu. So if we were to click that, you would see it in here. So that's a small change we made. And then finally, uh, we, made it, we made a few uh, slight customizations to the say Trevor blocks. So. Oh, I'm sorry, what's that not in menu thing? <laughs> it, yeah. it, it's stuff that is not displayed in the public UI or? Something? Yes, exactly. So it should say you have, well, let me tell you. Um, I'll show you this uh, in practice, how we've implemented it, it later when we look at specific exhibits. But um, we have one large exhibit that is an iterative development where we wanted not every feature page to show up in the uh, the curated features menu page. Um, so Travis went in and made it possible for us to say, I want this feature page to be published because I'll link to it from a feature page, but I don't want it to appear under curated features. And I'll show you that in practice. Uh, I see. Does that make sense? And then the final kind of big thing we've done. Oh, we've been Oh, sorry. Real quick, I was just curious, does this diverge from the core doing this functionality, or are you still keeping with the Spotlight as it, as it gets updated? Uh, we will keep with Spotlight as it gets updated. Like I said, currently we're trying to get through a different update that's pretty serious, so we haven't been updating Spotlight. But yeah, it's, it's hooked into Spotlight as kind of a, a module, so to speak. It should survive in the updates just fine. Okay, thanks. And then the last little thing that we've done is pretty small, but it's kind of a quality of life thing where we learned that the feature pages, if you went over a certain amount of them, it started to look really goofy on the page. So we just put in a little JavaScript into here where it cuts you off. Because after three, it's going to start looking kind of weird. So it just says the feature was a nice number of items. It is a little fun because one fun thing about this is if you took the sidebar off, it actually takes that into account and lets you put more in there. And it was, yeah, it lets you do it for five without the sidebar. Yeah. That's a fun little thing that we did just to make it, because we have content creators that don't necessarily, aren't, are new to Spotlight and they don't know all the ins and outs. So we want them to not shoot themselves in the foot as much as possible. Yeah, that's, that's about the customization we've done. We've done a few other ones in the past and taken them out and hopefully wanted to add them back in. But that's kind of the tech side of it. Is there any questions about that side of what's going on? Well, this is James from uh, Texas A&M. And um, I have a, a question maybe not about what, you're, what you currently have implemented, which is uh, very impressive, by the way. I like how you're able to import the Fedora objects. Very cool. Thanks. But um, you, you mentioned that when you move to uh, Fedora 4 from Fedora 3 mm -hmm. um, and uh, also do a, an upgrade of Spotlight subsequently, uh, you would like to uh, leverage the IIIF import mm -hmm. to uh, uh, bring in your materials in that way. And um, I was wondering what your plans were for generating those IIIF manifests, whether there was going to be an automated method doing that from Fedora or you're going to craft them by hand or what, what your plans were. Uh, we, I haven't, I'm only part of that process, so I haven't thought about it through it completely. Uh, I work with a couple other people on the repository itself. Like Spotlight's my little thing, but we have other developers on Fedora and Hyrax. So one of those guys is actually more in charge of setting up IIIF. So I'm not quite sure how he's doing it. I'm going to have to let him set it up and then I'll have to modify Spotlight to match it. Though I'm hoping that Spotlight's built-in IIIF stuff will work fairly well, intuitively with the Fedora 4's IIIF server. Yeah, I can, I can say from our local experimentation, it has worked pretty well with um, generated IIIF manifests. Mm -hmm. um, we have developed some code around here in Java, actually. It's a web service that um, can read uh, uh, Fedora content, provided it's structured with uh, PCDM RDF, and generate triple IF manifests from that. So that's the approach we've taken. Um, we'd be happy to show the code if anybody's interested. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. What, who is this exactly? Who's talking? Texas A&M. Texas A&M. My name is James Creel at Texas A&M. I'm a software developer here. All right. Yeah, I'll get in touch with you after the call. I'll send you an email or however it works, maybe a Slack. Sure. I'd definitely be interested in that for when it comes. There's going to be time pretty soon for us to do that here, too. Um, Travis, I have a question. <laughs> I confess I don't really understand your in-menu and not in-menu. <laughs> and I wonder if um, you have a published exhibit that is using this feature um, that you might be able to um, show it to me in some other way so that I can get a better idea of um, how, you know, the value of this to you and how it actually manifests itself to a user. Sure. I'm going to let Sari do that because she's the user that requested it. Hi. So um, I'm actually going to show you uh, one of our migrated exhibits, which was not the exhibit that sparked this request. Um, the exhibit that sparked this request is the one I'm mousing over right now called Another Light on the Hill, Black Students at Tufts. Um, and this uh, Another Light on a Hill exhibit is based on the work of a history professor who passed away in 2005, 2007. Um, that is an ongoing project, but I think the, the utility of, at least for us, the not in menu can be better seen in uh, this exhibit here, Tufts Answers the Call to Service, V12, and the NROTC at Tufts. Um, we have a number of exhibits that were built uh, here at Digital Collections and Archives. Um, in HTML and CSS, and we are trying to migrate those to Spotlight. Um, and sometimes that migration doesn't always work uh, easily because of the layout of the original exhibit. And we're really committed to not spending a lot of time editorialing or editing the exhibits. We just want to move them over as one-to-one -one as possible. Um, that exhibit at, uh, in its original form was actually one landing page with four smaller exhibits, some of them only two or three pages. And so when figuring out how to transfer those to Spotlight, that's where the in-menu, not in-menu really became helpful. So here in this uh, Spotlight exhibit, we have uh, the main page replicated, Tufts answers the call to service. Um, and then we've used the uh, Sir Trevor block to link to feature pages to sort of call out each exhibit or sub-exhibit um, so that you can click on them. And those are the four exhibits that are listed in our exhibits menu. Um, if you click into one of them, uh, you can then navigate through the sub-exhibit. If I scroll down. Um, a little lengthy. Oh, this one doesn't have sub exhibits. It's been a while since I've been on this one. I apologize. Um, let's do graduates in more time. I know this one has it. Um, so you have this, this sub exhibit page. Um, and then again, using that uh, feature page, I can go into these other pages about the specific people, uh, this exhibit profiles but they aren't in here cluttering up my menu. So I can use that in menu, not in menu to sort of create this hierarchy of exhibit, sub exhibit, and then pages that don't make my main menu here 20, 30, 40 pages long. Okay, I think, I've, I think I, you just made the light bulb turn on for me. These are all feature pages. Yes. Then. Yep. Okay. Um, it makes sense to me now. Thank you. Um, so, and uh, if I go into our back end here, and uh, it is in the options on the, the feature page uh, edit mode where I can turn that in menu on uh, or not on and off. Um, so that really allows me to create feature pages that are uh, sub pages to other feature pages, basically. Um, where that I, 
think is going to pay off for us in another light on the hill is um, we want to create uh, pages of biographies for all of the people mentioned in this exhibit. And so when you see Professor Gerald Gill, I want to be able to click on him and go read a biography, but I don't want 20 people's biography pages to show up in my name menu because that's going to be clutter and confusing to the user. Um, Sorry, just to, um, this is Gary at Stanford. Um, I'm, I'm sure you guys know this, but I, just to be clear, um, if you create child, there, there's two possible levels of feature pages. There's um, parent feature page and child feature pages. And um, another approach would just to be to make all these individual pages that you're not linking to child feature pages and they wouldn't show up in the pull down in the main menu. They would show up at, in the sidebar mm -hmm. uh, nested under the, the, the parent feature page. but. Um, just so it's clear. Okay, that's not something we've explored here specifically. Um, it's possible that this is an older version of Spotlight. Like I said, it's been hampered by our other migrations. So it's possible that we're using a version that doesn't have that. Currently. Yeah, we've had it a long time. I mean, it's it's maybe not as super clear as it could be, but in the just later on, just for you to to double check, you could, um, you know, when you go into the dashboard and you go to the curation pages category. Um, and you have their list of pages, just note that you can you can drag and drop the little um, panels for each page. And you can also drag in so that a, pa a panel for a page is, is nested under a page and that makes it a child page. So um, check and see if you can do that. I'm, I can't remember when we added this, but it's been a while. So I think you might be able to do that. Okay, I'll look into that, thank you. Um, uh, other things we have done with our uh, exhibits, just as a general overview, um, we've migrated our old exhibits, so things like uh, the NROTC, um, A Glimpse at Jackson College for Women, Muriel Simonson, those are all old migrations, so it's Memories of Tufts. We've worked with our art gallery um, to create a rather extensive exhibit exploring um, the history of a bus that had been misplaced for a while and then unearthed. Um, and it includes some cool things like uh, 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 embedded video from Vimeo, et cetera. Um, so it's gone a little bit beyond what I've necessarily done. Um, and we also have a uh, walking tour of on-campus sites. Uh, again, this was a project of the late Professor Harold Gill. Um, but here on campus, you can sort of uh, click in and read more about specific sites on campus. Our time is running short-ish, so I'm going to ask Andrea if she wants to say anything about Tish's. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Andrew Schuler. I'm the Digital Collections Librarian at Tisch. Um, I'm not going to demo anything right now. We only have a minute, but I just wanted to say um, a little bit about how we in the library are imagining using Spotlight. Um, the exhibit we have so far is the Gathered Leaves uh, Manuscript Fragments from Tisch Library, and we are mostly imagining Spotlight as a platform to kind of highlight our special collections and create access to collections that maybe aren't accessible in other ways. So these were some digitized leaves from our special collections that we made available. Um, some other things in the pipeline we're thinking about are some um, 17th and 18th century almanacs that we digitized recently. We're going to make an exhibit about um, a collection of Armenian, Armenian um, books that I think we're gonna make available this way. And we're looking at um, some artist books and um, collection of graphic novels around um, science and engineering. So those, that's kind of what's in the pipeline for us. So that's, that's all that. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's it for us. Are there any questions? Or is it, are we out of time? I can give up oh, to you my time if there's more questions. All right, so that's it for us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, and if anyone has any, thinks of any questions later, we can always come back at the end, too, if there's some time. 
So, um, yeah, so if you guys could stop sharing your screen so that um, Indiana can take over, that would be great. Okay, can everyone see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we're going to go even further back in time with even older versions of Spotlight and, uh, and other parts of the uh, Samvera stack. So uh, this is a, a, an older application that, that we worked on with a um, um, professor emeritus of, uh, uh, in the music school here who for since... Uh, it's close on to 50 years, has been collecting every, appear every appearance of a musical or an opera he can find on TV. So we, we uh, lovingly call this site Opera TV. And uh, it, it, he doesn't have recordings of it. He just has simply, uh, simply marked down uh, when, when the event occurred and who put it on. Uh, so you can see here, uh, this is a, a version of Carmen. Uh, sometime around the, in the 60s, it was the NBC Opera Theater. Uh, it was selections from it, and you can see then who the, the performers were, the broadcast date, the production company, and so forth. So basically what he's done for a very long period of time is collected as much information about this kind of activity that he can. And we decided we wanted to move this into Fedora, and we wanted to use Spotlight as the front end on that. But we found when we started working with Spotlight, uh, one of the problems we, we discovered was that Spotlight couldn't really share a, a solar core index with Fedora very well. It, it wanted to do its own things to that index, which didn't make, those, uh, make what, uh, what changes it made in solar compatible with what was going on in Fedora. So basically what, what we've done is we created two applications. The one we're looking at now is called BiblioCat since the basis of all this is going to be uh, actually uh, uh, about collecting bibliographic data. You may not have a lot of images and other things to go with it, but you're, you want to collect as much of the bibliographic information as you can. And so this, this tool writes directly and creates objects directly into, uh, into Fedora. And so what we've done is, so for, if I go here and say I'm going to go ahead and add a new televised opera, and we'll call this one uh, Spotlight the, the Musical, and and there's a whole bunch of fields you can add in here that he likes to keep track of. I'm just, but the only field you really need is that title. So I'm going to go ahead and create this. And when I create this now, oops, I misspelled that. Uh, when I create this, it's going to load this into Fedora. So uh, what we wanted then to have happen is that if someone went over to uh, to the uh, uh, spotlight uh, that we set up for this, that if they went ahead and searched for, uh, let's just say, it, search for spotlight, that they would then see spotlight, the musical would then appear uh, within the spotlight version. So basically what we've done is that when you hit that create button or that save button, we, modified the, the core code so that it would also save that into the uh, uh, solar index that Spotlight is using. So as you make changes to, uh, uh, as you add things and make changes to things inside of Fedora, those changes automatically get propagated down into the Spotlight environment. Now, uh, the other thing we were looking at in terms of this was we wanted to uh, we wanted also to have a way to uh, 
to deal with what we've come to call here flexible metadata. That is the ability to be able to uh, add fields. So you notice here we have these RDF fields DC, we have uh, duration that we picked up from the EBU core RDF file, there's uh, uh, another DC one. So all through here you can see that this is all coming in from different RDF files and basically what we want to be able to do is add any kind of uh, metadata that we want to and build it out in this YAML file. And then if we make changes to this YAML file, that would get, uh, that would get uh, reflected in the, uh, in the application. So here I took the word musical out of that, that title and I'm gonna do the same to both applications. We, we haven't quite worked out all the kinks where you only have to do it to one application. Uh, you have to make the change in two files, one for each application. And so once you make those changes, now when we go back here, so for instance, you'll notice in the Spotlight application, if I refresh the screen here, now it's going to pick up the fact that I've changed that work title from musical work title just to work title. And if we go over to here uh, and I refresh the screen, you'll notice then the same thing has happened. So the act attribute musical work title has now become just work title. What we were hoping to be able to do by working with this flexible metadata like this is make it so that you wouldn't have have to go in and actually write code in order to make these kind of changes. And the way that we, we've structured this within the, uh, within the application is each of these is, is in a uh, subdirectory uh, uh, called work types. And there are then, for the different work types, you can have then these different YAML files so that based upon the work type that you're creating, you can then have uh, different metadata that would be displayed or different uh, labels that would be displaying with each one of the metadata. So what, uh, what we were trying to do there is, is provide a more flexible way in order to uh, create new metadata fields within the application and also to be able to, uh, to change the labels easily. We have, we have several Fedora 3 based apps that we're working with that, uh, that, that we've done that with pretty extensively. Our image collections online uh, application, for instance, uh, when we set up a collection within that, we work with the curator or the archivist of that collection and try to understand what, what they're going to need and allow them to take like a creator field. And for some of, some of our collections, the creator becomes photographer. For other collections, it's the uh, uh, photographic studio. For other collections, it's the, the publishing house that, that owns that because we don't know who, who the actual creator of it was, the actual photographer was. So, uh, so they want different ways to be able to label fields and they want different, they'll be putting different types of values into each of those fields. So, so. When you so say that, that was really what drove us on, on the flexible metadata. When, when you say change it in two applications, do you mean in Spotlight and in Fedora or is there yeah. any? So, yeah, so the two applications that are running here, this application is uh, BiblioCat. BiblioCat, uh, points to Fedora. So you're changing it within the application. You're not changing, you're, you're not really changing the field in, in Fedora per se. Uh, you're displaying the way it displays that within, within, the, uh, within the Bibliocat uh, application. And then the, the other application is Spotlight. So we have a Spotlight application that's running uh, against the uh, solar core that contains the spotlight uh, information. And that solar core is automatically getting updated whenever you make an update through BiblioCat and update something inside of Fedora. 
Um, Will, I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm wondering um, what, what this gives you um, that the ability to change metadata labels in Spotlight, a feature that already exists, does not give you. Well, it, it may exist. I'm not sure what you mean by being able to change it. Uh, part of what what that's related to is not just the ability. The the simple part of what of what we are trying to do with flexible metadata was being able to to change the label. the The harder part of that that we were trying to do, you may have noticed, is being able to read in or use values from RDF files. Uh, or RDF schemas in order to populate or extend uh, the uh, uh, metadata without having to go in and code that directly inside of, of a, of a uh, Sambara application. So normally if you wanted to add a, 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 a additional fields, you'd have to go in and do do some kind of special coding and accommodation to be able to add those additional fields. This would, this does, you don't have to do that. This is all being done in that YAML file. So the YAML file, the YAML file is only read by Bibliocat? Uh, it's also read, uh, it's also read by uh, the Spotlight application. So you notice that, that it, it's work title change from musical to work title as well. I see. So it's using that to populate the field names in Spotlight. Yes. As opposed to going through the Spotlight UI, like Kathy was saying. Right. And, and again, the, the the part of the reason for that would be then uh, it helps you be able to extend into other uh, uh, RDF and other schemas uh, and uh, and be able to add those in through that YAML file rather than uh, uh, through uh, another means. So it's, a, it's, I don't know that one is particularly better than another. And I, I, uh, so, but um, the other advantage you have is that if for a, another work type, I wanted it to say musical work title, then for that work type, I could have it say musical work, ti work title. And then for a different work type, I could have it just say title, uh, or I could have it for a yet another work type, I could have it say working title, because each of those YAML fields are driven by the, the work type. So depending on the work type is what it's going to pick up, which YAML file it's going to use to determine what, what labels to display. Um. I, I think that helps. And the only other thing I wonder, and I don't know enough about this, I don't know if Gary from Stanford could comment at all, um, because it's, I'm not totally clear about whether um, we, we now um, have, a, um, have a pop out window at the um, record view level that allows all of the metadata in the online library catalog to be displayed. It sounds like that still whether I don't know if that's more of a local customization and I also it also sounds to me like that still wouldn't quite meet the need that you've expressed here. Um, but uh, I guess that that's more of a comment or unless Gary has something to add. Well, I, I think the problem we were trying to solve here is is being able to have uh, Spotlight be automatically updated with changes that take place in Fedora and not not having it to be dependent upon uh, uh, a, a curator or an archivist knowing oh I've added these new items into Fedora or I've modified these items I need to take some step to make sure that my stuff in Spotlight gets in sync with that or, or I have some, you know, tomorrow when, when my re-indexing runs, everything will get back into sync again. Uh, so we were looking for a way to do that automatically, to have that happen without having to, to uh, wait or to, for having anyone realize, oh, I need to do something to make these, these two get into sync. 
if we were, we built this today based on, on code, you know, we, we modified the code for the save button. If we were doing, if I was doing this again today, I would recommend that we probably use, and, and we have used this successfully on another application, is that we would probably use uh, Camel, which is part of Fedora 4, and use Camel routes in order to read the Java Messenger service. And every time you make a change to, uh, uh, to something within Fedora, it generates a uh, Java message that ends up in the queue. And then Camel can read that message queue, and then based upon what it reads in the queue, it can go take an action like update something or, or modify something or uh, uh, delete something or add something. So you could do this work I would probably do today by, by just leveraging Fedora 4, putting things into the Java Messenger queue, and then using uh, uh, camel to uh, to uh, do this update into solar and we do that right now we have a uh, what we call uh, digital collection service which uh, which is our I mean digital collection search which is our uh, uh, a cross collection search tool and basically we have things in se several different fedora repositories and using these camel routes whenever we make changes there they propagate those changes down into a large cross-collection solar index we have that allows you then to search for, for any item in any of our collections, uh, no matter uh, which, fedora they, which fedora they originated from. So there, you probably know more than you want to know about that now. <laughs> Well, it's interesting that you have this model of uh, pushing changes mm -hmm. from Spotlight to Fedora. Is, is there some um, authentication or login control there so that somebody who's running Spotlight can only submit stuff to Fedora if they have? Well, uh, the, the, this, the tool right here that's called BiblioCat, this is a, uh, uh, this is a Samvera application. And this is what's updating Fedora, and it's Fedora then that pushes that change into the Spotlight Solar Core. So it's not going from Spotlight up to Fedora, it's going from Fedora into Spotlight. And we, we probably wouldn't allow changes to happen from, uh, from the Spotlight application into Fedora. I, I see, I see. I think at the beginning I missed that there or three apps here. <laughs> well, well, think... there, there's two applications here. One is BiblioCat, which writes to Fedora. Mm -hmm. And then right. there's Spot. Mm. And then when you say create something in Fedora, it also creates that record in the solar index for Spotlight. And then Spotlight reads that in from that solar index. Yeah, I, I get it. I think at the beginning I was confused and thought that BiblioCat was Spotlight, but I think I get it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. BiblioCat's its own Sambera application, and then uh, this application, Televised Opera Musical Comedy Database, this is the uh, uh, Spotlight application. All right, thank you so much. Does anyone else have any questions for Indiana? Uh, yes, yeah, this is Doran at, at, at oh, NLM. Sorry. I have a question. Go ahead, Liz. Yeah, thank, thank you both for the demo. Um, uh, yeah, quick question for Indiana. Uh, so you're, you're pushing items into Fedora, and then, and then you'll update the solar used by Spotlight as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Do you make all of your Fedora items available for use within Spotlight or, or just selected uh, Fedora uh, objects? It would, at this time, it's just selected Fedora objects. It's just certain collections would, would, would be available. Uh, so so we, we've done Spotlight on a very limited basis, and this is a very old version of it. Uh, we're going to have to uh, address this problem of uh, allowing uh, 
custom user interfaces that would be built with Spotlight in order to, to access more and more of the data as we move it into Fedora 4. So at that, that's where we would want to be looking at using uh, camel and camel routes in order to pull uh, messages off of the uh, JMS queue and, and decide where exactly and how we would need to uh, populate information in other areas. So you can have very complex logic in, in the code that you put into uh, JMS. It, 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 I mean the code you put in the camel routes. So. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. If there aren't any more questions, I'm going to stop the recording, but I don't want to preempt somebody who hasn't had the chance to ask. Yeah, it's uh, James from Texas A&M once again. Hey, James. Yeah, and um, so uh, the, uh, met the metadata management occurs um, entirely in the uh, BiblioCat application. You're not using um, the Spotlight UI for editing metadata values, right? Right. So, um, and the uh, metadata edits are propagated um, by updating the solar core for Spotlight. Yes. So, um, and I, it's just my lack of familiarity maybe with some of the technical characteristics of Spotlight, but um, I'm wondering if, the, if that's the only place where the metadata live. Do they, are they also present in the database? And so, would this approach then um, lead to trouble, perhaps, if you were um, wanting to use Spotlight's UI in addition to BiblioCat's UI to edit the metadata? And I don't know, maybe Gary can weigh in on that. I'm not sure. Well, the item metadata would only be in Solar. Okay. The database wouldn't store the item metadata. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I think the answer to your question has to be yes. I mean, we have the problem, same issue here. There's one home source for the metadata. And if we harvest it from the source, you don't want to re edit it in Spotlight because it won't be pushed back into the source anymore. And it wouldn't go back into Fedora in this case. So. Right, right. Yeah, so in that sense, we don't really, uh, uh, other than building the structure of the website, we don't really use uh, Spotlight for any other kind of administrative work on, on the metadata. Makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, in the interest of time, because I know we have a few administrative things that Vanessa wants to get to, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. Thank you, everybody.